15 um, for the suffragists um, in Massachusetts. It's their local symbol. Um, Maine had adopted the sunflower as their symbol. On July 17, 1915, suffragists across Massachusetts posted thousands of these bluebirds on fences, telephone poles, public spaces in towns and cities to encourage support for women's right to vote. I am jubilant. I am jubilant. Thank you. And thank you for this opportunity to, for the cause for women's votes. Thank you. Thank you. I've, I've labored for that for ever since I was, oh, even before, since my 20s. And now I'm 71. 71 and old and achy and, uh, but, and tired, but still, still have something for the, to uh, promote the votes for women. <laughs> Stay the course. Stay the course. It can, you know, I've been pelted with stones. I've been pelted with rotten fruit. But you know, you keep on talking. You keep, you stand firm. Stay the course because it's worth it. It's worth it. We need to change the thinking in this country so that women win the right to vote. <laughs> These three colors in the United States are the, the colors representing the women's movement in the United States. Purple, white, and gold. Oberlin College in Oberlin, Ohio was the only college in the whole United States granting a degree to women. Now, there were other colleges, such as um, in, in um, um, Amherst, uh, Massachusetts, and, and in that area, that were allowing women to attend classes, that we could attend classes. In fact, I started there, but once I realized I wasn't going to get a degree, that was a waste of my time, and so I changed and I switched and I took the train to Oberlin, Ohio, where I could get a degree, because a degree means something. It's a sign that you have knowledge and power, and so I needed a degree. Uh, I worked for the abolitionist movement um, for about five years in that way, touring, touring around the country, right? And then I switched more to the women's um, movement because I felt called more, still, still remembering the abolitionist movement. But, but putting my uh, focus on women's rights. And not just women's rights, not just white women's rights, women of color as well, both deserve the right to vote. The government did not recognize us at all. No, nope, no, and so that's why I felt that um, I had to focus on changing customs in the United States rather than just working individually with people I wanted to change the laws because if the laws were changed then people's thinking would be changed. I was the only woman during my time, during my lifetime, uh, yeah, since, since I've started the cause, I was the only woman who actually met with a legislative group. They had, I had their ear for at least, they may not have agreed with me, but they heard my arguments. So I felt that was uh, very important. And I could be planting seeds. What people say one day, maybe they'll give it a little thinking, the seed will germinate, and then later on they might change their minds. So that's why you have to keep on going, keep on talking, because you never know what seeds you've planted and how you need to help them to grow along. Um, yeah. no. uh, the Historical Society Garden Tea. Uh, this is funded with a grant from the Temple Bridge Cultural Council. And we're glad you came out to uh, enjoy this beautiful day and some tea and goodies and pastries. I know. We're celebrating a year late. We're celebrating the passage of the 19th Amendment of the Constitution, which gave women the right to vote. Yay! We had planned this for last year, but you know, things have gotten away. So, uh, so we're glad you're all okay. We have with us today uh, Lucy Stone. Yeah. Lucy. And 
uh, the tea is uh, here to benefit the uh, historical society, as, as I'm sure you know, but it's also just for fun, entertainment, and uh, to learn a little bit about the 19th Amendment and uh, women gaining the right to vote. So right now, put yourself back. This is the year 1890, and Lucy is here to talk to you about the efforts of the women who went through for many, many decades to gain the right to vote for women. So Lucy, welcome. And I'm not using a microphone, so please let me know if you can't hear me. Can everyone hear me okay? I, I have to, um, I've, I've always been told that my voice has been very, very strong and, and loud and um, that, I've been a, that I'm a good speaker. However, I now am 71 years old. This is 1890, I'm 71 years old. And unfortunately, I've been in a lot of pain lately. And, and I just don't seem to have the energy I, I did in, in my youth. So if I, if I stumble a little bit, please, please forgive me. But my passion, my passion for the vote is strong because ladies and gentlemen, we have not yet, after decades, we have not yet, one, the right to vote in the United States of America. Women are not allowed to vote. We've been fighting since I was 25. I'm now 71. We've been fighting since I was 25 and not, still nothing, nothing. Men will not give us the right to vote. In this country, it's a shame. Now, when I was born, I was born in 1818, not very far from here, in um, West Brookfield. <laughs> it's my mind, you know, the mind is going at 71. I was born so not very far from here in 1818 in um, West Brookfield. And at that time, my mother told me at that time, when she discovered that she had given birth to another girl, she cried. My mother cried because she knew how hard it was for women at that time. Women had no rights. My mother was a devoted Christian woman. And my father, he did not go to church, but he felt as many men did that he ruled the roost, that it was his house, his money, and my mother, literally had to beg him for money. One time she wanted a, a new tablecloth. We were going to have visitors to our farm. We lived on a farm. We were going to have visitors to our farm and she wanted a nice new tablecloth as a way to welcome them. And she knew that if she asked my father that my father would not give her the money. But I thought my father, of course my father would, would give her the money. And so I asked my father and guess what his answer was? Wow. No. If the tablecloth is good enough for family, it's good enough for visitors. My poor mother had to sneak into my father's purse at night and take out coins in order to buy her children a dress or to buy things that we needed because my father always felt that we had enough. But we didn't have enough. I mean, we were, yes, I always felt that we were exceedingly well off to do. I was raised on a farm. I had the fields to run in and I loved the farm. I loved growing up on the farm. But when my mother needed money, my, she had to go in at night into my father's purse and, and steal steal coins, or we had a cheese house. We made cheese and, and we had abundant uh, cheese. We had a lot of food living on a farm. We didn't want it all for food, but we had a cheese uh, manufacturing building. And my mother would have to sneak into the cheese building and, and sneak out some cheese and sell it in order to earn some money. If my father had known, he would have been very angry. So it was a hard life for a woman. If, when I went to work, um, when I grew up, I first uh, worked as a teacher because I loved to learn. I loved to learn. And I, so I would work as a teacher. And my earnings didn't come to me. 
My earnings went to my father. That was the law of the land. A woman who had a job, the money that she earned would go to her husband if she were married or to her father if she were not married and lived in her father's house. Where is the justice in that? And I couldn't understand it. Why is this happening? This is not right. Even in church, even in church, the pastor, my pastor, I belonged to the Congregational Church in West Brookfield. Even my pastor spoke out against women speaking in church. We were to be silent. We didn't have the right to vote in any church decisions because the Bible, what does the Bible say about women in church? The Bible says women must be silent. Women must not speak in church. So that got me roaring mad. And so do you know what I did? I undertook the study of Hebrew and Greek so I could go right to the very first origins, the very first books of the Bible in the original language that was written in because I wanted to read for myself. Where does it say in the Bible that women must be silent in church. In fact, you know, when I was young, I would cry. I would cry thinking, how can God treat women like this? The God of love, how can God treat women like this? I just couldn't understand that. One time in our congregational church, one time the pastor put one of our members on trial, Deacon Josiah Henshaw. You might know the Henshaw name from Templeton. I visited with Henshaws in Templeton. But one of the de Deacon Josiah Henshaw was put on trial by the pastor for his, anti, for his abolitionist work. Now he, like I, believed that all people should be free, including people of color and he was a strong abolitionist, as was the pastor here at the, at the, um, uh, at the uh, uh, Trinitarian Church, uh, no, not the, yes, the Trinitarian Church, which is next to your library. That pastor was a strong abolitionist. But the pastor at our congregational church in West Brookfield felt this was wrong and felt that what Deacon Josiah Henshaw was saying could harm the church. So he put him on trial. And at that trial, I was in attendance. I was up in the, the balcony because women weren't allowed to sit in the main floor. But I was up in the balcony and when they called for a vote, I raised my hand <laughs> to, to, um, to say that he was not guilty. I raised my hand in support of Deacon Josiah Henshaw. But the pastor said, ignore her hand. Women cannot vote, ignore her hand, but I voted anyway. I kept my hand up. I stood strong, ladies. We must stand strong. But the council ignored my hand anyway, but they did, um, Hensh uh, Deacon Henshaw was um, found not guilty at that time of that. But eight years later, eight years later, the church excommunicated me, <laughs> kicked me out because of my views on abolition, for abolition, working for abolition. Too radical, too radical. That's something I heard all my life. Too radical, too radical. I worked hard for the women's movement and I vowed that I would never marry because my focus was on rights for women and I thought that marrying would only deter me from that because when you marry, who takes control of your life? Your husband. No, that could not be. However, I did meet a man. I did meet a man and we fell in love. But I didn't want to marry him, but he convinced me that if I married him,
that we would be strong as a team. He believed as I believed, and so that working together, we would work for the women's cause and be a greater voice. So at 37, I married. Now he came from quite a family. His, his name was Henry uh, Blackwell. His sister-in-law, no, his sister, his sister became the first woman physician in the United States. So you understand what a family he came from. And I did see where that they could be great allies for the woman's cause. And so I worked, worked for women's causes, women's rights, and it was difficult. Sisters and brothers, I have been, I have been stoned. I have had rotten vegetables thrown at me as I speak, as I spoke. But let me tell you, and don't be afraid of that. By my saying that, don't, make, don't be afraid to also stand up and speak for women's rights. Don't let that deter you, because I'll tell you what happened. There was a time when they were throwing rotten vegetables at me. I got down and being booed. I was being booed by a big group of men, being booed but I stepped off the stage because they were booing me so loudly that obviously I couldn't speak anymore. So I got off the stage and I walked straight to one man that I, that who seemed to be the lead, the lead the, uh, of all this, the ringleader of, of, all, of all the booing and the opposition. And I woke, I stood right up to him and I held out my arm and I said in a very polite voice, would you please escort me out of the room? He thought that I was going to attack him, of course. I, that, that totally threw him off balance. He didn't know what to do, and do you know what happened? I can be very convincing, ladies. <laughs> I can be very convincing. He guided me back to the stage. He quieted everyone, prevented them from booing anymore, and I could resume my talk. I can be very persuasive. And it doesn't take, you know, just gentleness, persuasion, it really works. And people saw something and they listened. One time, one time, I was, um, well, let me back up, college, okay. I, I studied Hebrew and um, Greek. So I decided that it wasn't enough for me to, to study Hebrew and Greek myself. I wanted more of an education. Now my father paid for his sons to be educated. My father believed in education, but not for girls, not for women. But I wanted an education. I wanted to know more. Yeah. I enrolled at one point in a college, um, Mount Airy in, um, in Massachusetts, but it wasn't giving me the education I want. So I, it didn't offer a degree for women. It allowed women to attend classes, but it didn't offer a degree. So I went out all the way to Ohio. Oberlin College in Oberlin, Ohio, where I could get a degree. And I chose, a de uh, I chose to learn how to speak better because I knew that in order for me to talk about the women's rights, I needed to speak well and speak fluently. So I enrolled in the public speaking classes there in Oberlin. Plus we had religion and, and other sorts of classes too. And I became valedictorian in a sense. Yes, I did. I, I, I was. I was valedictorian, ladies. But, but, do you know what happened? I could not give the valedictorian address because only a male could give the valedictorian address. Even though I had the highest grades, I could not give the valedictorian address because I was a woman. The college said, write your address and we'll give 
it to a male to, to, to give. But I said, no. And you know what? My classmates, my classmates, male and female, my classmates said, no, we won't do that. We want Lucy to speak. So my address was never given. My address was never given. When I was at college, women weren't allowed. I was in public speaking, but women weren't allowed to rehearse their public speeches. What we had to do, we had to sneak out of our dorms at night and go into the woods and gather in a circle and rehearse public speaking because we couldn't do it in the classroom in public. So we had to sneak out at night. What was that? What was that? But I learned. I learned public speaking and, and when I graduated, I, I went to college when I was 25, spent four years there, borrowed money from my father. My father did, a, uh, did agree to, to lend me the money and I paid it off because while I was at college, I worked as a teacher <coughs> to pay off my father and I paid back my father every single penny, every single penny and I'm very proud of that. But when I was at college, and then I graduated with my degree, I was looking around for places how to speak. And my brother was pastor of the, one of the congregational churches in Gardner. Now, at one time, there was one congregational church in Gardner, just as there was one congregational church here in Templeton. But in the 1820s, 1830s, 1840s, there was a split over belief. So many people um, left the, their congregational churches and formed a new congregational church, which is how the Trinitarian Church was formed here. The original congregational church in town became a Unitarian church here, just like in Gardner. So the church split into Unitarian and what they call Trinitarian, belief in Father, Son, and, and Holy Spirit versus uh, Unitarian, only one God, and no Father or Son. So they split, and so my brother Bowman, I call him Bo, uh, my brother Bo was pastor of the, the, uh, tri uh, to the, of the Trinitarian Church, and he said, Lucy, come and speak. So the very first time I gave a public speech was in my brother's church in Gardner. So give yourself a... And, and maybe some of you were there. Were any of you there? Maybe some of you were there. It was, it was glorious. It was glorious. And then I went on speaking um, at another church a, a, a month or so later. But from that, I was hired by the abolitionist movement to go and speak across the country. Now, back then, public speaking was the best way of getting your point across and getting the news out public speakers. There were many um, lyceums and, and other uh, events where, where you had public speakers. And so I was able to go across the country. It was great public speaking. But, you know, I was speaking for the abolitionist movement. I wasn't speaking for women's rights. The abolitionist folks said you're being paid to speak about the abolitionist movement. You can't speak about women's rights. So you know what I did? Monday through Friday, abolition. Saturday and Sunday, women's rights. <laughs> women's rights. Something that really tears against me. I, I was one of the, in fact, I was the leader. Uh, I'm the one responsible for calling together a women's rights convention in Worcester before Seneca Falls. Before Seneca Falls, there was Worcester. Ladies, we are to be congratulated. Worcester before Seneca Falls. And I was also a speaker at Seneca Falls, but Worcester, I'm very proud that I was responsible for, for pulling all that together. And it was from Worcester that they saw that they needed something that would reach out to, to a greater area. Hence, they did Seneca Falls.
But what hurts my heart is that it came to a decision. The women's rights movement felt, uh, it was divided, we were divided. Half of us felt that you, we had to drop the abolitionist cause in order to focus on votes for women. We felt that it would weaken our campaign for, to win votes for women in the United States if we also worked for abolition, for the freedom of colored uh, men and women. That broke my heart because that's where, that that's, was part of me too. And so the women's movement split. For a time, the women's movement split. There was those, and this is with Katie Stanton and Lucretia Mott, the big names that you've probably heard of also, they went with the group saying women's vote only. We're not going to deal with, we're dropping this, uh, the abolition movement. I could not. So my group still kept true to the abolitionist movement because if women cannot vote, if white women and women of color cannot vote, that what justice is it in there, in that? Justice must be for women of color as well as white women. We're all equal. And if we don't, yes, yes. And if we don't support our sisters of color, we're, we're, it's a farce. We're not true to being ourselves. So we had to split. We split. That, that really tore me apart. I, I, I didn't like that, but I, I had to remain true to the women of color. We joined together again initially, and um, wounds were healed. Um, Susan B. Anthony, you might have heard of her. Um, I'm the one who brought her into the suffrage movement. She heard me speak, and I brought her in, yet she went with the other group. And when uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and others wrote a history of the suffragist movement, I wasn't mentioned. I wasn't mentioned, even though I was an integral part of it. I wasn't mentioned. But yet I continue to fight. I continue to fight, even though at 71, and I'm in a lot of pain, and I, I feel a little bit of pain coming on now, so I, I think I need to, uh, to sit down, but, but the fight must continue. Sisters, brother, brothers, don't give up the fight. Join me to secure votes for your children, for your daughters and your granddaughters. Without a vote, we can have no say. Votes. We must have votes. Thank you.